we have been seeing how philosophy of education can help practitioners to get conceptual, empirical and ethical understanding. So, in the next lesson we will be focusing on some of the Indian thinkers ideas on education. These ideas certainly help us in getting a better understanding of what we talked about in the philosophy of education lesson. And uh, some of these uh, Indians have been staples in the teacher education curriculum across the country. So, we will uh, focus more on the conceptions on education, the pedagogic uh, implications rather than focusing on the isms. For example, uh, Rabindranath Tagore is considered a naturalist. Gandhi uh, idealist. So, this ist and isms we will set aside. So, the objectives of today's lesson would primarily be to look at uh, Swami Vivekananda and Rabindranath Tagore's conceptions of education, what are the pedagogical implications of these conceptions and uh, what according to them were the qualities required of a teacher. So, we will focus on these three ideas. We will uh, look at Swami Vivekananda's ideas first. To Swami Vivekananda, knowledge is inherent in humans and the process of Uh, himself uh, elaborated that it is a question of becoming conscious of that knowledge that is within. He was a great proponent of giving uh, free scope for growth. He believed that liberty is the first condition of growth for children. And I quote uh, Swami Vivekananda here, he says education is not the amount of information that is put into your brain and runs riot there undigested all your life. So, for him education was primarily for building character and help one to stand on his or her own feet. So, what were the pedagogic implications of these uh, ideas? And I further quote uh, Swami Vivekananda, according to him the only method of education is concentration. And uh, he stressed that we cannot teach a child and I quote him, you cannot teach a child any more than you can grow a plant. A hundred years back, you know he had this uh, conception of you cannot teach, you can only facilitate learning and growth in a child. And he also stressed that we have to provide only positive ideas to children. He said the child primarily teaches himself or herself and the external teacher only offers suggestions which will help the child become conscious of the knowledge within. The qualities of a teacher according to Swami Vivekananda, he had very high aspirations from teachers and he said the charge of imparting knowledge should fall upon the shoulders of Tyagis, one who are able to sacrifice everything. A teacher is one and more importantly, he says a teacher is one who can convert himself or herself into a thousand persons at a moment's notice. So, that is what we were talking about uh, uh, earlier about meeting diverse needs of uh, students. We will now move on to Rabindranath Tagore's ideas on education and schooling. Tagore not only put forth ideas, 
Uh, he was a prolific uh, writer, as you all know it. But he also ran a school for a pretty long time. Shantini Ketan, he was directly involved in the running of, setting up of the school and the running of the school, which later became a um, full-fledged university catering also to higher education. But he started out um, teaching young uh, children. And his other experiment was Sri Niketan, which was primarily a village development program. So Tagore has the distinction of trying out his ideas himself through his own experimentation. And Tagore's primary concern was on harmony. To him, school was a place that would have organic connections to its surroundings and provide such an education that would help children be in touch with their complete life. And by complete life, he meant uh, economic, social, cultural, intellectual, aesthetic, and spiritual. I quote Tagore here, the highest education is that which does not merely give us information, but make our life in harmony with all existence. Do you see echoes of Swami Vivekananda um, also here? In his quote also, we saw that isolated bits of information is of no use to anybody. And two of the most important ideas in Tagore school was happiness and uh, freedom. Tagore expected his students to be happy. By that he meant they should lead a full uh, life so that their minds are prepared to receive education in all its richness and not merely to acquire and hoard isolated bits of information, has said in many places. He has written a beautiful uh, essay called The Poets uh, School. I mean, his ideas uh, have occurred in his own uh, um, newsletters that he was uh, bringing out. The school was written later in his life and it is a reflection of his own school days as well as his ideas on what schooling can be and uh, the ideas that emerged from his own engagement with the schooling process. So you need to hmm, read some of these uh, thinkers uh, writings in their original and not depend on secondary or tertiary sources. It gives immense joy and pleasure to read directly their uh, ideas. So coming to the pedagogic uh, implications of Tagore's ideas, he believed that in cultivating the intellect and imagination should happen through active engagement in everyday life. And he was highly critical of a mechanical, lifeless education that emphasized rote learning unrelated to the day-to-day -day life of students. So again and again, he keeps making this point. I quote him once more, the process of education should be full of life. Constructive and creative activities should be the methods of education. Hence, for him, it was of paramount importance that mother tongue should be the medium of instruction. And uh, physical activity and training in a manual craft um, has to be compulsory in schools. Tago believed that the rhythm of life is lost if the harmony between the physical and the uh, mental is lost. He would give uh, freedom to his uh, students to walk around in the class, to run if they want, uh, to climb uh, trees also. So I think the important message that we need to take from Tagore is the harmony part. You know, we have to think beyond simple uh, binaries and strive for harmony, not exclude one or the other. For example, yesterday there was a discussion on uh, um, whether we should give homework or not. 
whether we should have a teacher centric or a child centric education or if we should go only by the prescribed curriculum or um, teach as per the students interest. So, it is not a simple question of either or, it is the way in which we are able to maintain a harmony, we are able to balance between these um, extremes that is what is the most important uh, pedagogic lesson that we need to take from Tagore. And uh, Tagore also strongly felt that all of us have an inner urge for self expression and he felt a child's urge for such expression should attain fulfillment through the creative arts. So, drawing, music, dance, um, drama, literature all these formed a very um, inherent component of the curriculum um, in Tagore school. And he felt that learning should be through independent effort and uh, thinking by the students themselves from direct sources as opposed to cramming from books and lectures. And he felt that children should be led to think, reason out and use their imagination through dexterous questioning um, again by teachers. In a letter to a teacher who was working in the school, Tagore wrote work wedded to joy is work at its best and to him the spirit of joy also helps to mold character. Tagore introduced an integrated uh, and uh, correlated activity based uh, curriculum in his uh, Siksha Sastra experiment. So, this was again an experiment that he tried out in his uh, school and this predated uh, the famous uh, Kirkpatrick's project method that is quite popular now. Now that we have seen two of the thinkers ideas, we will uh, reflect a bit on how relevant uh, these ideas are in today's context. I mean if you look at the historical uh, context of uh, the ideas of Swami Vivekananda or uh, Tagore for that matter, this was the pre-independence day era and uh, the colonial education was uh, very much entrenched during that time. But 100 years hence these ideas are still relevant. Now, we are still grappling with rote learning as we have been seeing from for so many studies now and our own experience also tells us that rote learning is still rampant and quite common in our schools. And uh, despite the national curriculum framework 2005, the many state uh, school curriculum are packed, they are loaded with information and uh, too many concepts. For example, uh, one state uh, science textbook uh, of class 7 um, has three concepts, this is a chapter on light and uh, you have reflection, you have refraction and total internal reflection all three concepts dealt within one page of the textbook. I mean how can a teacher help a child make meaning, the meaning making that we have been so passionately talking about when the curriculum is so overloaded and so packed and she is expected to do justice to the curriculum. So, these are things that we really have to seriously think about. Is it important for us to pack information into the children's heads and promote rote learning or through schooling should our intention be more towards helping children learn? Information now is easily available, schools do need not provide uh, um, all the information, children can go seek information for themselves. So, it is more important that the curriculum helps a child 
seek information when she wants to, where she wants to and make sense of that information. We still have rigid regulations for teachers and uh, some of these uh, chain group of uh, private schools have standardized uh, plans and uh, resources. These things suck the very um, dynamics of a classroom and the context and the meaning making that we are talking about goes for a toss in these kinds of um, standardized approaches or the so called teacher proof uh, approaches. These definitely do not uh, augur well for the schooling system in our country and these issues were raised almost a hundred years ago. And we continue to emphasize intellectual development despite what these thinkers have told in terms of overall development. We do play lip service to it, holistic development, overall development. But how much of it do we actually do it in our schools? It is mostly the intellectual uh, aspect that we focus on and even that intellectual is from a very narrow limited scope. We do not allow our children to think critically, we do not allow them to reason things through. So, even intellectual development is highly narrowed down in scope and when it comes to other uh, aspects like aesthetic development. I am sorry to say our schools are doing plenty little or rather very little in terms of giving scope for these creative urge that uh, Tagore talks about for children to express themselves through different uh, means. That is just not happening. If at all these are reduced to um, co-curricular uh, spaces and uh, as add-ons um, within our uh, school timetable and uh, as the exam approaches subject teachers uh, do not shy away from utilizing those uh, periods as well to complete their portions. So, we really need to think hard, what is it that we are doing? We have been studying these uh, ideas for quite some time now, these ideas have been with us. There have been experiments, quite a few experiments based on these ideas. There have been plenty of uh, studies that have happened uh, both in the regular mainstream schools as well as in some of the alternate schools that draw from these ideas. But we are really not gathering these findings and infusing them strongly into the mainstream curriculum. So, we have to as teachers, there are larger systemic issues, but then as practitioners, as teachers in a classroom, we need to reflect on how can we incorporate at least some of these ideas in my everyday classroom teaching. So, how can I address the issues that prevent me from using these ideas in the classroom? How much of it will I be able to solve as a teacher on my own? How much of it do I need support and help from others? These are not answers that we will come up with in a day or two, but these need considerable attention and our constant effort in making them a reality. I want to share one of my experiences regarding aesthetic development ma'am. I used to work as a tutorial teacher which uh, starts from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock in the evening. So, there I taught a lesson uh, on mitosis and meiosis. After completion of the lesson, I asked the students whether they were able to appreciate the work done by the a tiny cell of a size of micron. The immediate answer I got was like, uh, ma'am, we want to prepare for the essay rather than appreciating its work. 
So how can we remove this essay fear from the students? Um, it's really sad, uh, uh, Gautami. Um, so when we are talking about this mainstream uh, schooling experiences, um, this whole uh, tutorial business that is running uh, as a parallel stream as it were. And uh, certainly in the cities, I think uh, a majority of the children, more than 90% of them attend some uh, a tutorial of some kind or the other. So, you know, by the time they finish their school for six or seven hours and then come late in the evening, and I really appreciate your effort of uh, bringing in the hmm, aesthetic understanding uh, part, uh, even though it was so late in the evening. You will have to understand the child's, uh, the children's mindset also. By then they are so tired that all they want to do is you know, just be done with it. Tell us what we need to write in the essay. We learn that essay, go write in the exam and score well in our exams. So this is that culture that we have been speaking about that we need to break. It's not going to go away so easily, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, we need many more Gautamis, both in our <laughs> mainstream schools and uh, the tuition centers because they are well entrenched now. And uh, give opportunities for children to imagine and again, you know, make meaning with what they are learning. And this whole societal uh, aspiration of uh, marks, and we spoke about this yesterday also, uh, success or failure um, in society is largely dependent on the mark that a uh, child uh, scores in the examination. So the stronghold of examination must be loosened. That's precisely what NCF 2005 talks about. But it has not come into practice it as yet. So within our spaces, we'll try to ensure how best to uh, develop aesthetic sensibilities among our students. For now, that's what we'll do but continue to hope for a better future for our children. Hello ma'am, uh, as we were discussing about Tagore's ideas, what if we, you know, in today's scenario, apply the same idea of letting children free, like running, jumping around the class, uh, what will be the situation ma'am, and how can we control it, when we need to, you know, grab their attention or something? Okay, that's a very pertinent uh, question. Again, we'll dig into Tagore about what he said. He said it's harmony that is of utmost importance. When he said leave uh, children free, I mean in his class he had that kind of hold and the charisma to allow children to run and uh, jump about. But he didn't say that all of us should uh, blindly apply it. And again, I am a little perturbed by not just yours, um, you are still a student teacher, um, but generally teachers ideas of controlling uh, children. So do we want to externally control them or do we want that kind of control to happen from within? So in a class where we are able to actively engage uh, the children both physically and mentally. In such a class, children would automatically control themselves. So they would, if they find meaning in what they are doing, they would want to involve themselves. Even if one or two um, try to create a disruption in the class, the others would kind of tell them, no, we, we, we are interested in what we are doing, so please don't disturb us. So that kind of control comes from within. And also we must remember that children are by nature very active physically. And if we force them to sit unnaturally, 
for hours on stretch. So that is when this whole problem of discipline arises. So again I do not mean to say that you know when you are teaching you just ask you could allow them to uh, walk around or run around, but finding that balance where you are able to uh, give children the freedom to move when they feel very restricted physically, balancing it out with the necessity of the child paying attention to what is happening in the class. So, that is that is a harmony, that is a balance that each one of us have to seek for ourselves in the context in which we are in and that changes from school to school, from teacher to teacher, from children to children, even from day to day. The same set of students, one set of activities or one set of rules would have worked one day, but the very next day that may not work. That is where the dynamism of classroom comes into play. So, that is where reflection takes such a crucial role. So, that is where we can find harmony. So, that harmony is also a kind of a dynamic harmony. It is not that you know I found the balance today and this balance will eternally hold good for me as long as I am a teacher, no. That will be thrown out of balance in the very next class, you will have to seek a new balance. So, that is what makes a teacher's job both challenging as well as extremely interesting and fulfilling. Thank you. Thank you.